It is a great honor and privilege to introduce Bernd Koshland. We are in Hendon in, in London and um, you were a kinder transport. So Bernd, I'm so grateful to you. Um, so if you could just relate how you, how you became a kinder transport and your background and the family history. Yes, I will relate my background, yes. I was born <coughs> in Firth, which is a town in Bavaria, next door to Nuremberg, in 1931. Um, and uh, the town of Firth, in which I was born, was traditionally called the Jerusalem, the Jerusalem of southern Germany. It was a very orthodox town, although in the German sense of a Jäcker, as distinct from other forms. Uh, my parents, my father was, until the Nazis removed him from his job, was a representative in a sh for a shoe company, and my mum was my mum, right? And we lived in a flat in the town. Now, life, of course, for an eight year, for a young lad born in 1931, as I grew a little bit older and Hitler came to power, life changed for Jews generally. And there's little I remember of that. I can still picture the brown shirts in the street. Um, and in fact, I have a memory of Hitler himself, who was passing in a train either to or from Nuremberg, which is literally next door. Uh, then the next thing really to remember is, apart from childhood memories, which are of any child would remember. Of course, I remember my parents as best as I can. My father was a very orthodox Jewish, Jewish man. Um, and uh, I learned with him, he taught me to read Hebrew using a method that he invented himself. Then instead of the old fashioned books teaching you to read Hebrew where you get nonsensical combinations of words like Bagada and Dabadi and all the rest. He used German words in Hebrew letters which made life much more interesting and uh, he would use for example say uh, a tet your chin tish I would learn those three letters and a tish is a table so that was that. Then the next stage in life was the Kristallnacht, uh, of which I've got memories of being marched down with my parents, my sister, uh, who died last year and was seven years older than me, Ruth, marched down to the space where we had to assemble and there we stood while the <coughs> rampage of the Nazis took place in the town breaking into houses, shops and of course sadly destroying the shoes in the town which were in fact there were four shoals in one, I mean old shoals, not steeples, uh, going back, the oldest one going back to 1600 or something, and nothing is left of them. Eventually, women and children were allowed home in the morning, parents were taken away, sorry, not parents, correction, 
men were taken away and uh, assembled in a building in the town which uh, was donated to the town by a Jewish businessman um, and still stands. In fact, I was there when I visited the town. And the men were taken away to Dachau. Now, just as an aside, when I was in Israel a few years ago, or a number of years ago, we went to Yad Vashem, that was my close friend and her niece, and as you went into Yad Vashem at that time, there were cameras up above, and uh, one, uh, not camera screens, which showed you um, various scenes from the shore. But one said, Kristallnacht, I said, well, I have to watch that as I was there. And as I'm watching it, a picture flashed up of prisoners in Dachau concentration camp. You won't believe it, but out of that picture jumped my father. Unbelievable. I've got a picture of it inside. Um, you know, it's when I say jumped up, <coughs> it is as if he was sitting where you're sitting. Right. Had you ever seen that picture before? No, uh, yes, strangely enough, in the Atlas of the Holocaust by uh, Martin, Gil Gil Martin Gilbert. There's a little picture about that size, which is that picture. But, you know, when you see a picture like that, you don't stop to look who it is, because you can't see the faces anyway. Anyway, that was that. Anyway, Dad came back after a few weeks. He was released ostensibly because uh, we, he'd received, so we informed the authorities, a visa to go to Paris. Anyway, he came back. And this must have been end of December, beginning of January. 39, 38-39 and the decision was made if I can jump ahead by my parents something has to be done now the kinder transport had started actually in December 38 when the House of Commons government agreed to let in children into this country uh, on conditions that they came on their own, that they were under 17, that they had somewhere to go, and that there had to be a deposit of £50 for each child, bearing in mind that £50 was a lot of money in those days. was a lot of money. And that eventually I, the children, when grown up, if the war ever entered would end if the situation would end would go wherever home or whatever which was never enforced right so a relative distant relative had apparently so my sister told me uh, informed my parents that there was one vacancy on the kinder transport leaving in march if they wanted the place. Now, they decided yes. Yeah. And that was it. Now, I've got several issues in my own mind. Issues how my parents must have felt to say yes to something like this, to let a child go of eight as I was then, or just uh, just turned eight, how they must have felt. I know as a parent myself, if I would have to make that decision, I don't know what I would have done. But their decision was, we'll send him, and 
with promises, we'll see you as soon as we can, which is, you know, for an eight-year-old, okay, you can't see me next week, maybe two weeks, or in three weeks' time. Uh, we'll promise we'll come and join you. And to make it a bit sweeter, that when your mitzvah comes, we'll buy you a suit with long trousers. Now, for a child at that, at that age, and in, it was, you know, youngsters didn't wear long trousers, they all wore, you know, shorts. Wonderful promise, you know. How I felt, I can't really remember. I suppose for me it looked like being a new venture, an or adventure is perhaps better, of going somewhere where I'd never been before. I'd been away with my parents, there's in fact a picture here on my left uh, of the four of us on a ho our last holiday somewhere nearby. Um, and so the time, time came for departure. Well, this is the picture over here. Yeah. I'm just going to... Do you know where, where you went for the holiday? I can't remember where it was. It was a holiday somewhere. And in the picture, it's your sister and you and your parents. Yeah. So that was a journey to be undertaken. How I felt, I don't know. Possibly, you know, it's a new adventure for a kid of eight who didn't understand probably very much of the situation. Now I left my father and my sister Ruth on the platform of Furt Station and I went with my mother. She accompanied me to Hamburg to uh, join the group that was coming to England. Can I just ask Bernard, do you remember Sorry? Do you remember saying goodbye to your father and your sister? Yeah. It must have been very emotional to say goodbye. It, it was. You know, I mean, I didn't know would I ever see them again. And how mm. come your parents decided to send you and not your elder sister? Well, she came actually a couple of months later. She's, she was, she was unfortunate, she died last Hanukkah. Um, she was seven years older than me. Do you remember what you took in, in your case? Or? Oh yes, there are lots of things. Um, for some reason or the other I was able to bring a huge trunk which still exists, not here, it's in my, the loft of my daughter who lives just down the road, and uh, another case and um, boarded the boat. And when you said goodbye to your mother? And I said goodbye to my mother. Was, that must have been also very emotional. Yeah, and uh, boarded this boat up there, the Manhattan. SS Manhattan. It doesn't exist. It, uh, it was a liner running from Hamburg to New York. That was on the 24th of March, 39. Yeah. And this is the, the picture of your, your of parents. The liner apparently allowed 80 of us on board. And we came to England. Uh, with been a three-day journey via France. Had you ever been on a, um, on such a ship before or a liner before? No. There were eighty of us, and I know that there were eighty because I've got the passenger list. Oh, 
us 80. And did you have any friends or did you know anyone else on the ship? No, I'll tell you what happened. I used to edit the Kinder Transport newsletter for a few years and I'd gone to speak to a group of people down in South London and one of the people who was organising said we've got a list of some of the passengers on the boat that you were talking about I'll send it to you and in the next edition of the newsletter I said I've got a list of uh, 80 of uh, sorry 30 or whatever the number was and um, back came an answer from somebody in Oxford uh, is my brother on there I said no that's all I've got and within a few weeks months he sent me the other half of that and I've got the list and the person who did that I didn't realize who he was I mean, I called him by his first name, Gunther. He happened to be professor of law at Oxford, knighted and an honorary, in those days, QC, and a well-known uh, academic in law. And was he also one of the Kindertrons? Yes. And he was on, on, on the On the same boat, on that boat as I was. Um, I mean, I didn't know him, I'd never met him. All I know is when I said to one of my grandsons, Sammy, you're studying law, have you read the book by, and I can't remember his surname. Yes, it was absolutely boring. <laughs> anyway, that's it. So we arrived in this country, a lovely journey, and if I can put it in a side, it um, infected me with a love for journeying by sea, right? if that's the right way of putting it. Uh, when later in life, uh, after unfortunately after the death of my wife, I became friendly with another person and she and I would go traveling, we went on cruises, which, you know, thanks to that. And Bernard, can I just ask, when you were on the, on the ship, yeah. Had you ever been separated from your parents before? Had I? Ever been separated from your parents before? No. How, did you feel very lonely or how were your feelings? I don't know. I, I just... My memory has gone... blank. Perhaps if I were to dig down with some kind of psychologist or something. But... I was just one of the kids of age, I think must have been one of the youngest on there. And uh, I just followed the crowd, I suppose, and we landed in Southampton, uh, and we dispersed, and a few of us from the boat went to uh, Margate. I don't know if you ever heard of Margate. Uh, to a hostel there run by Nebrath and um, in the posh part of Margate I've got to be careful you know uh, Cliftonville and there I was in the hostel and I was the youngest apparently and there I had to settle down um, learn English. I had no knowledge of English. My parents had taught me a sentence in English. I'm hungry, may I have a piece of bread? I mean that was my full knowledge of English which would have got me on a train from London to Birmingham. I don't think. <laughs> anyway, I learned the language um, the one thing that I do want to mention is it was a Jewish hostel. It was 
perhaps more in name than anything else. My father had taught me an awful lot, Jewish-wise. And I think once I arrived here, my knowledge went down. Was it, did they have kosher meals? It was all kosher, I, su I suppose, yes. And was there any prayers or did they take you to shul or synagogue? I have no idea, I can't really remember. I just, I was one of the crowd. And the school you went to? Sorry? Was it a public school that you went to? Um, I'd been to school in Firth already for a year. And the school in Firth, was there yeah, a public a school, school? A Jewish school. Yeah. And uh, I arrived in England at the end of March 39. And by Oct October, I'd gone to my first primary school in this country, in Margate, these, I don't know what it was called, St. David's or something. Now, living in the hostel meant acclimatizing myself to a new way of life. And as a kid, I think it's much easier than in 15 year old um, and you know sort of did things what children do at that age. I learned how to play hopscotch, very important you know. You never know I might have been a hopscotch Olympic champion. That's when we played with the older ones who changed the rules as we went along. Uh, I went to my first cinema in my life, uh, first film, and saw The Wizard of Oz. Uh, whether I understood it or not is another thing. They say it has a Jewish theme, The yeah. Wizard of Oz. And sort of uh, life started again. Can I ask, but not at school, did you did you get on very well with the other students, the British students? Must have done. No. And did you ever feel any anti-Semitism at no. school or? No. And did they not ask? That, not that I recall, because once war was declared, and we had to walk around without gas masks and identity cards, right, which is a sore subject over here still for present day, I mean. Um, all I remember learning when the decision was made at government level to evacuate children from various areas. And as Margate was on the coast opposite France, uh, and if there had been invasion or anything or bombing, away from the front line and uh, I was evacuated to a village in the Midlands not far from Birmingham. <coughs> you know, can I just ask you, when you were in Margate, did you get any correspondence from your parents? Sorry, yes I did and I should have added that. Um, I got letters and I suppose I replied but then some idiot of a friend, if it was a friend, said you can't keep those letters once war was declared. And what did idiot me do? What a pity. And that was it. I have actually got a copy in yeah, of a postcard that came just a day or two before the outbreak of war that was sent to my sister. So we were in contact until then. And how did your sister leave? <coughs> Kinder transport. Do you know roughly what date she left? What date? No. June, July. And when she came to England? She came, she went to a family. Did you have any contact with her? Yes, we had contact. 
had contact with the family that she lived with. Uh, in fact, the man uh, whose name was Bernard Gilman arranged my bar mitzvah later on. And I just want to ask you, when you met your sister, yeah. you had been separated and I... How did you meet her? Did, did she come visit you or did you go visit her? She must have come to me and I don't know if she ever came to Margate. Um, I think I possibly went to see her. And do you remember that encounter when you when you An first encounter met? that I went, I went to stay where she lived. But when that you I saw do her, remember. when you saw her, do you remember that? that oh yes. It must have been extremely emotional when you met her. Must have been. Yeah. yeah. It was, uh, I went there a couple of times to Streatham, which is South London. Um, and then of and course... you went by yourself? Because you were, you were still very young. You went by yourself to visit her? Probably. I don't know. All I know is I was there. You know, my memory yeah. of these details has gone. But contact with my sister was in a sense broken when I was evacuated to uh, the Midlands to a non-Jewish family. Uh, there were eight of us Jewish children in the village. Um, no problems at all about you Jews, you foreigners, you whatever. We mixed with the kids locally and it was a lovely village life. Jewish wise, uh, Jewish wise it was not very much in evidence. Uh, we did have somebody who came on a Shabbat to the area because there were several areas where Jewish children were in that area and uh, we'd walk over for kind of service, I don't know, whatever. And that was it. Um, for Pesach, the only one I spent there, um, we were individually issued with a packet of matzot and some margarine, and that was it. So do, what do you we know who helped with the matzahs? Who Sorry? Do you know which organisation helped? I don't the know matzahs? who did it. Some of the refugee organisations, Neighbourhood perhaps, I don't know. Did you ever meet with Rabbi Schoenfeld? Schoenfeld, oh yes, many years later. I mean, but not during this time? Yeah, but I had no connections with him at all. That, um, I don't know who sent it. Jewish Refugees Committee perhaps um, and the other thing I remember Jewish wise not very much um, it came to Rosh Hashanah that year and we stayed away from school obviously on the first day our decision think of it eight nine year olds ten year olds making a decision when the master who was in charge of the evacuees of the school with which we were evacuated came, called us together and said what's this nonsense about not going to school if you don't go to school whatever will happen will happen to you well we had no way of appealing to anybody and I suppose we went to school and went I hope the Almighty has forgiven me. Absolutely, sure. But relief came when uh, my sister, possibly distant relatives who lived here in Golders Green, uh, thought they could find a place for me in a hot Jewish hostel run by the monks community of Golders Green, of which you've heard, no doubt, by the late Rav Munk, Zichron Levracha, um, they applied 
and I was accepted and I went to live in the hostel in a place called Tyler's Green which is down south in Buckinghamshire and that was a proper Jewish hostel run on German Yekish lines right? I'm not trying to be anti anti-Semitic anti anything else uh, I mean Rob Monk himself was a Yekka the warden of the hostel and Mr. Bear and his wife were from Frankfurt and uh, it's a Yekka 150% Yekish and we eventually had a teacher who also I think came from Hamburg and uh, from Frankfurt so that was the hostel it was really from and orthodox and it renewed my Jewish spirit and uh, I went to my third primary school in this country I'd been in the mid Margate in the Midlands and here and went to the uh, my scholarship to the local grammar school the Royal Grammar School High Wycombe and uh, I became very British you know and Jewish wise everything was according to Kadas and Kadin uh, we had to lessons almost every day in Jewish learning homework could wait Shabbos we probably had a double dose um, and that was it and the one thing that I remember clearly from my days in the hostel and I was now growing up slowly um, I learned how to take a service as a bar to filler um, I learned how to read Chris Atora um, which I did for years afterwards and you know Jewish life was in practice right? and at this time did you still have communication with your parents no I'm c I'll come to that right now there was no further communication from my parents as far as I knew all I did know and I think I only found out after the war I'm not sure was that my sister had contacted my parents by the Red Cross and got an answer and she sent me a copy of it I've got a copy of that here uh, and that would have been at the end of 19... 41 something like that because by was it 41 42 they were no longer alive that we found out after the war by somebody who survived that the people from Firth had been deported or some of them to Ispica a camp near Riga or part of Riga in uh, Latvia and that's where they perished and they told us what had happened to them that you know they'd, they'd perished there and for some reason remembered the outside dates of the deaths of my father and mother do you remember them still remember which I've got recorded and I keep father's death uh, was um, where, where was it 
listen yeah yeah right at the beginning of the year and that's it if i could ask a favor if, if you could show um if i could just because it's you'll have to unclip it is this a picture this is my sister and me wow but before i'm going to just unclip this one This is a wonderful, you've put together a picture of your mum and you and your, your father. It's mainly me. And it's the older generation. I'm just going to show it to the... This is your grandparents, your, your father, your grandparents. And here you have a picture of your mum and you. Well, sorry, I can't see. My sight is not good enough. On the top um, left is a picture of your mum and you. That could be, yes. Uh, and here's your, your father, your grandmother and you. Me. How did right. these, how did these pictures survive? Uh, these are copies from my sister. She had these originally. So when she came to England, she must have brought these with her? Yes, and some photographs came also from um, Switzerland somehow. And this is a later picture of your sister and you. How old were you? It's a beautiful picture. How old were you at this time? Put on there. Yeah. It's a beautiful picture of you and your sister. I was a teenager. And Bernard, when you heard the news... Sorry? When you heard the news that your parents had, uh, had been murdered and killed, it must have been devastating. I took it in my stride. I sat the traditional hour shiver and that was it. And you kept a very close connection with your sister all the years? Yeah, I keep the outsides all the time, of course. But you and your sister, you were very close? Yes, we became much closer eventually. Uh, she used to visit me in the hostel in Tyler Screen, Monk's Hostel. Um, then she joined the army. And uh, when she came out, I saw quite a lot of her. And did your sister remain religious? Yes. She married... I was going to say she married her husband. It's the most normal thing to do. Um, in fact, I knew her husband before she did. Wow. He'd been a visitor to the hostel. And... Um, eventually they moved to Canada in 1951 and remained there, right. And did you go visit her? And I've she came been, to visit? I went to Canada a number of times, yes. And Bruno, what happened when you, when the war ended? Yeah, when the war ended, uh, life went on, war ended, the hostel had to move because the premises were derequisitioned or whatever and we found a place here in North London and I was there in that hostel from 45 till 48 and that's when I first got to know Rabbi Schoenfeld uh, because I used to go to his shul. Um, 
and I went to school again here in Golders Green. The beginning of, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Hasmonean. Well, it started in Golders Green and <coughs> I joined the school in in its year, what we call, I think, year 11 now, and took my exams and then left. Uh, not very happily, I was not happy at the school particularly. I'd been used to very good English grammar school. But I got on and passed my exams and that was it and uh, went on hoping to teach French. Now you probably wonder why the hell I should want to teach French and the answer is that's what I wanted to do. And uh, where, where did you learn French? At school. I thought I was good at it. The examiners thought I wasn't good at it. So I didn't. Uh, the, uh, in the end, I stayed with a family in Golders Green for a year or so. Um, but I'm caught up with someone who called my foster parents later and lived with them. In fact, Finney was my kindergarten teacher in Furt and came to England, married over here and I lived with them. What, was the, so what were the names? Sorry? What were the names of the family you stayed with? And Zimmer. Zimmer. Like the Zimmer frame, you know, you walk with no connection. And I stayed with them. And uh, very happily, it was really lovely staying there. I then went to, what was it to do? Um, and I, it was decided by the secretary of the hostel committee she advised me said why don't you try to go to Jews College which was like you know a small training place for rabbis teachers so I said okay I applied um, and when I was interviewed um, before, sorry, before the interview, I had to read the booklet of what I had to know for the interview, right? Can you imagine to learn Gemara and learn this and learn that and learn the other and know two or three pages of Talmud, etc. Well, I did all that. Now I applied. Chairman, sitting there, his first question to me was not what did the Talmud say in whatever what sport do you play? Uh -huh. I didn't, you know. And I was interviewed also by the principal of the college. He said, what do you really want to do? I had no idea. I said, I don't know, I'll be a youth minister, whatever that was, sounded good. Said, no, you're trained to be a rabbi. And that's how I got in and started. And uh, at the age of 22, while still studying, I took up my first position as a Minister Rabbi of a community. And you, you had smicha? I didn't get smicha at all. But I was a, called a minister. And uh, at the age of 22, of course, 
you know the answers to everything. Would you agree with that? So true. Anyway, I had my community, I was in charge of it, aged 22, uh, uh, age 22, that's right. Which community? It doesn't exist anymore. It went out of business some years after I left. Do you remember where it was? It, it was a very small Kehela. I think it had 90 members or something. And um, I moved on from there after a couple of years elsewhere. So uh, that was it. And what else? And then I went into the to other kahilas or to go another kahila, um, a larger one, and then moved on to an even larger one in North London. So up to then I was south of on the river. Literally, my second show was. If you were sitting there in Shul, the river would have been wow. the other side of that building. Um, but I got married there as well in that place. And uh, eventually I got out of ministry and went into teaching happily, what I'd always really wanted to do. Never mind about teaching French. What did you teach? I taught Limudi Kodesh, basically, Biblical Hebrew, religious studies for exams. Um, I was the head of house for a time, for a year, and a general dog's body in the at, school. At which school? The uh, JFS, Jews Free School. And you enjoyed it? I enjoyed the first 20 years thoroughly. The last three or four years, not so much, until I was made redundant after 24 years. And I then went on to teach. Somebody found a job for me at a girls' school, a public, sort of a private school, the City of London School for Girls, which was in the City of London and uh, I taught them very, very happily for seven years of Jewish children, extremely happily, until I had to retire at the age of uh, 65. It was mandatory to retire? Yeah, we had to retire. In fact, I have here, where is it? Somewhere. Yeah. And when did you keep your connection with Munchal? No, I never had any connection with Munchal, no. Because once I was in London, firstly I went to North, no, in North London, there I went to Shredfield's Adas or a minion around there. Um, when I moved to Gilda's Green, I went to Stiebler, which wasn't my scene at all. And then when I moved further again to my foster parents in North London, I went back to, the, to a minion, and then it all stopped. The, what is interesting, and I should mention that, I've got the archives of the hostel that I was in, all the records, which um, came to me when the daughter of our secretary of the hostel who passed away, Sissy Rosenfeld had passed away, 
when they were clearing her goods, they found all the archives and the daughter rang me and said, would you like them? And I said, of course. And I've kept them. It's probably unique uh, insofar that it covers the existence of the hostel from its beginning to moving to London. It's historic. Yeah, I've got it. It's a huge box. It's, uh, and it also deals with, the archives also deal with a girls' hostel run by the same committee. Um, and the archives of that hostel and the person who ran it and worked together later at JFS. Uh, what is also interesting, um, there are, was a move after the war to try and get hostels to sort of form a, a union. And Sissy Rosenfelder, who was the secretary of our hostel, was in contact. You've heard of Freshwaters? Well, the Isaiah's Freshwater, that's the father of the current ones, he wouldn't join in and wasn't from enough, etc. And I have got his letters, his original letters of which I sent copies to the two sons who couldn't have cared less. Right. And Brent, can I just ask you, um, when you when you were together with Rabbi Schoenfeld, did he mention to you what he had done before the war and and during the war and how he had rescued, they said, maybe, maybe even over 3,000? No, no, the, my contact basically was in shul. And also, he was the principal of the Asmonean. Did you know that he was very active in his own kinder transport? I didn't know at all, no. And he never spoke about it, or? No, not really. When they asked him, how many people did you rescue? So his answer is, that's not the question. He said, how many did we not manage to rescue? Yeah, I mean, uh, he brought a quite a number of youngsters over. He put them up in. It was even his mother's home. In Queen Elizabeth Walk, somewhere yes, yeah. in North London. In Stamford Hill. But I was in contact with him. In fact, interestingly, he once contacted me. They were looking for a new head teacher for the Hasmonean. He said, you do. Come, uh, let me interview you. Right, we'll introduce you. Thank God, nothing ever happened. I wouldn't have been a good headmaster. <laughs> it's not my line. Uh, and that and was my knowledge of Schoenfeld. Can I ask, did, did you keep in touch with other kinder transport? A little bit, yes. Reu did you go on reunions and conferences? You had, yeah, there were reunions in in the first one was about 88 or something and then I was on the outside I didn't go uh, beauty four or whenever it was but after that the chair of the kinder transport organizing committee uh, the late Herman Hirschberger, whom I knew, distant relative, etc., dragged me into Kinder Transport and joined their committee and was active on it for a time. I edited for nine or ten years a newsletter. I edited a couple of brochures for them and worked with them for a time. I've now more or less pulled back from everything. I'm not in a state to do anything. And Ben, can I ask you, there were many kinder transport that went to non-Jewish families from the very beginning. 
they went to non-Jewish families. Yeah, and they lost the the. They say possibly even up to a third. They lost the the complete knowledge of Judaism. They didn't even know they were Jewish. Yes, the answer is that a lot of children, and I use the word, of, as a whole for the kinder transport. Um, probably disappeared uh, as Jewish children or perhaps they knew they were Jewish and that's it. Um, I don't know what figures are, I mean, I've never studied they that. They say possibly it could be a third. There could be a large number, I mean people have written about all of that. Um, it's difficult to know. I mean, there were roughly 10,000 of us. And by the time the end of the war came, where were the 10,000, right? It's a question. Uh, I, there is a book, I Came Alone, which tells the story of a lot of individual kinder and you can see from there that some of them disappeared. Did you ever feel, why did your parents make that decision in the very beginning or before you... Uh, Sorry? Did you ever, were you ever, I don't know if you were the right word, not resentful, but were you very upset that your parents had made the decision to send you alone? to separate from your parents, that they made that decision. Did I ever hear about it? Did, did, did you ever feel yeah. uh, upset that your parents decided to send you alone? And to no, separate? I, I have no guilt feeling, if that's the word. No, or were you upset with your parents ever for having made that decision? When, yeah. you, when you were young, did yeah. you ever feel upset that your parents made that decision? They made that decision and that was it. And you never felt upset that they made that decision. No, it's a, it must be one of the most the most difficult decisions that a parent yeah, can well, ever make. The answer is that the outcome is that life had to go on. My parents never reappeared, and that's it. And I'm very much the person who looks forward in life rather than backwards and uh, active to do my bit which I have to do and uh, I have been active in the Jewish community since my first job um, and I've been busy in the local community around here also for many years in a variety of ways. And did you speak to your children about being a kinder transport in the war? <laughs> a little bit, yes. Yeah. Um, I gave a talk on my visit to my hometown uh, and they heard a lot about it. Beth heard, of, my daughter heard about it. My son came with me to my hometown and he learned some of my background that way. And uh, that's it. There's this question of how do the second and third generation react? I tested Beth, that's my daughter, on this and she said, there's no trauma there, right? Because maybe it's the way that you imparted your yeah. your history and your knowledge to your yeah. children. Yeah, yeah, there's no trauma. And when you went back to, to Germany, was yes. it a very emotional to go back? And do you remember from your childhood memories the town? The answer to that is, for many years, I didn't want to go back, didn't want to know anything. But by some way I got an invitation to visit my hometown. I took it up and went back. And it sort of 
cured me and I've been back to Germany two or three times. And Brent, if I can just ask you, what, what message do you impart to your children and grandchildren and to the future generations? What? What message, message. Do, you, do you give other? The answer is yes, and I've said this over and over again. Each person has a little peckle on his back, a burden, uh, whatever. Yeah. Uh, my particular peckle on the back was what happened to me, right? But that's on my back just to remind me. But you have to build for the future. Uh, what I did was when um, I can show you this here. Please, yeah. Yes. You see, I used to show this to children that are taught, spoke about it. We must make this world A, and they have to fill in what these dots would be. Oh. A better place, and that this should never happen again. Oh. That's so true. And that is the message that I always give when I talk. You know, one can talk about the past, but we've got to talk about the future. And can I ask, you always remained your Imanah, your faith? You, did you always keep your Imanah, your faith? I keep, sorry. Did you always keep your faith, your Imanah, your, yeah. your belief? You always kept even having heard about your parents being murdered? Yes, my, my belief is that all the time. It may not be as strong as my father would have liked mm -hmm. it, but it's there. That's wonderful. I just want to thank you. I'm going to just come in, um, if I can just thank you. I'm going to just put this aside. Put this over here. Right. Shall I hold that for you? If you could. So this was on your 90th birthday. So it's been a great honor and a privilege to be with you. Yeah. And I'm so grateful to you. Yeah. And your story is just riveting. It's unbelievable. And yeah. you are such an example for all of us to emulate. You yeah. it's it's just amazing how positive and you went through so much and you've remained some you smile and you're positive yeah. and yeah. such an example and yeah. your parents would be very proud i think so and this was your nancy at so maybe stream yeah. till 120 in good health yeah. with all of hashem's blessings actually i must correct you the wish is now 119. 119. do you know why well, because 120 there's nothing to look forward to uh, but 119. 119 there is still something to look forward to. It's Actually, not my story. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. Yeah. Well, you should just have mazel and bracha yeah. and all of Hashem's blessings. Yeah. And I'm so grateful that I came. And thank you so much for yeah. for just relating the most incredible story. Yeah. Not your story, your life. <coughs> yeah. In fact, there is a book there of my life. Um, what I wanted to show you. No, it's not important now, but um, when I, yeah, it, uh, oh, this is, this is, this is where we you, lived. Well, you're very modest. You've got an MBE. Yes. Oh, if you could show that picture where you lived, that would be, sorry, if I, if you could just, is that the, the home you lived? 
apartment and how would you pronounce the street um Kreinstrasse sorry how would you pronounce the the street name the street's name uh, Karolinenstrasse does it still exist yeah oh yes well at least when it was there 20 years ago we lived up the top so this uh, um, this is so wonderful it's um, my story by Reverend Bernd Koshland MBE yeah. I never knew you had an MBE yeah. or if you could just show possibly if you could just page through because you've got such beautiful pictures inside the book yeah. Yeah, there. I mean, there's some of those pictures you've seen. Say, you know, the various pictures of my life. And if you want to start anything, we Koshlins are fighters. <laughs> Three brothers. And they were in, in the German army? Yeah, West World War One. Dad, uncle, uncle. And he had the Iron Cross. The Iron Cross. Oh. I don't know what for, but. I'm going to go through if you don't mind it, because this is... Sorry, that's my dad. This is your father. I just want to show you a couple of pictures of him. Uh, this is a picture of your mother. Mm. Very distinguished. Sorry? Your parents were very, very, you can see, extremely distinguished, very... Yeah. With your sister, it's amazing that there's so many families that they don't have pictures of their parents or... Yeah, I've got lots of pictures. Now what I wanted to show you was something else. With your mother. Just to show you that we Koshlands are a fighting force. This was your last holiday, that's the picture that we had before. And with your mother and your sister, your, your mother and your sister. There you see. There's a, the fighting Koshlands. The left is my dad in uniform, and on the right is my sister in the British Army in World War Two. It's amazing. Yeah, the when did you get your MBE? Uh, two or three years ago, I got it. And um, you remember your meeting with the Queen and uh, in Buckingham? You did you go to Buckingham Palace? Yeah, there's a picture of it there. It's the same picture. It's in here. Okay. So this is your father. In Dachau? Yeah. Is it? I don't know. Yes. Have you ever been to Dachau? No. I, I went and it's it's awful. It's a yeah, terrible, I terrible I place. I want to go back. This is when you travel to England? Yeah. I never went. I didn't want to go. Yeah, but these, these pictures are so precious. It's Sorry? They're so precious. Yeah. And this is your travel allowing you to leave and it had a J on your passport yeah do you still have a picture of my yeah. passport thing do you still have the passport yeah I've got it I've got a better picture here actually uh, one thing I haven't got here is space somewhere this is later at the hostel And do you, do you have a, um, a copy of the um, 
a copy of the um, letter that was sent to your, your sister from your parents. Copy of? The letter that your parents sent to your sister. The post, the postcard or the letter oh, that yes. your parents... I'll find it. Finney and Nathan. Somewhere. This picture, which has nothing to do with me personally, this is the silver breastplate of a safe Torah. Uh, we were taken to the Jewish Museum, to the Israel Museum by one of the guides who we knew and said this crunched silver was found in the knapsack of a Jewish, of a German soldier. Wow. So, I've got a picture of that. This is you hiking in 1952. Was Henry Fisher also kinder transport? Who? Henry Fisher. Yeah. But he was a close friend. He was a friend, dear. Yeah. And this is when you were a... Did they ever call you reverend? Yeah, they still do. And did you ever want to get Smicker a uh, rabbinical ordination? No, I never finished it. I couldn't be bothered. I found it. This is Kanaka in Kingston. Too boring. Yeah. And this is on you with. You see, here's that list or part of it. Oh, oh, this is the list. Yeah. Part I'm of just. It. If I can just. Uh, I wouldn't. Well, I don't know. I have to protect it. I it? know, but if I'll just go. If you can turn it around a little bit. Yeah. Just. Wow. That is incredible. Wow. And I think you had from the Red Cross. Sorry? I think you had... Uh, this is your passport. There's my passport. Or a copy of it. A forgery. I don't show the original because I treasure that. Yeah. So I made a copy of it. Well, there's the postcard things come together. That is our last postcard. Jacob Cushland. It's from your parents, dated the 29th of August, 1939. Yeah. And this is a good forgery. It's a copy. A I made a copy of it. You must always keep the, the originals. And I've got the original inside. And to, hand, and to keep it within the family. So here you were, a, a, a civic service at Woodside Park with the Mayor of Finchley. Yeah. Mm. Oh, and this is when you were at the JFS. You see the and you're in the middle with the pale jacket. This is incredible. The other thing is this particular picture. A smiley and a not a smiley. Which would you rather be, I say to children? Him or him? Right? But you know, there's a, a kinder transport in, in Yerushalayim. Yeah. There's a patient of mine. And she of, often says to me, when I look at a glass, I don't see it as half empty, I see it as half full. And I think that's what you epitomize. You sorry. She looks at a glass, 
And she says, I never see it as half empty. I always look at that glass as half full. Yeah. It's just it's, um, her perception on life that she wants to remember the positive, that she yeah. was saved, that she was with, not to look at the negative. Oh, this is with your wife and you. This will just be a minute. It's this is very special. Yeah, no, I just have to. This is a Holocaust Memorial Day. And when you invited to give talks, you give talks. I give, I've given a lot of talks. And this is the mayor of Barnet. Excuse me, Sam. Hello. I'm all right. I'm fine. How are you? Yep, I've just got a lovely visitor here. Yeah. Oh, this is and what about you? In Pellane School. What are you doing? I can hear you, yes. And this is your first day at school in Germany. It's, n it's not very clear. With a big kind of sweets. Can you hear me? Yeah? Yeah, everything's okay. Now I can hear you better. I can hear you better now. Yeah, everything's fine. And receiving the MBE from yeah, Prince William. Yeah. Bye. Brent, can I just ask you, because this is very special, when you received your M when you received your MBE from Prince William, um, was it? A, it's a culmination of recognition of what you went through, and no, it was for my teaching of the Holocaust children mm -hmm. and so on. Have you seen an MBE? Well, let's show you. Would show you one. Just with your, with Johnny and Beth. Wow, that's very special. You had very special parents, very. Oh. If we can, you have your MBE? I've got it outside. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That would be wonderful. Carlos, yeah. I'm just coming outside. Outside? No, not outside, I'm just going out. <laughs> special that that is just amazing and you can see on the other side it's oh, nothing, that's nothing that's where it's made but this is the MB it's the MB that must must have been a very proud moment in your life it was if ever there was somebody deserving. Sorry? If ever there was somebody deserving, Prince, it's ready here. Well. Oh. Well, I'm so glad and thank you so much. It's okay. Oh, Prince, thank you very much. And you have from Lord Jakobovitz, I'm sure you knew a lot of the chief rabbis. Oh. I mean, I've never really taken it out and put it on. Oh. But, uh, it's very special. Ben, thank you very much. And this is Jews College. Sorry, University of Lansbury.
you got Khan, Khatan Tara from the Hindu United Synagogue, and from the Mayor of London. Just ask you, you have from Lord Jacobowitz from a memorial safer Torah? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That makes freedom of the city of London. Yeah. And this is incredible. I could know. You are extremely modest. You are showing my superiority. You cannot take sheep across London Bridge without paying for it. I can go free. It's amazing to have freedom of the city of London. Wow. With this I'm very proud of, particularly. and for interfaith relations in Barnet. Well, I'm so grateful to you, Bernard, and just, may you just have all the muzzle and brocha. Yeah, thank you. Have you got my friend? So after you retired, you were a hospital chaplain? I was a hospital chaplain for 20 years at a local, a major hospital around here. And you, and a, were the patients, would they ask you questions or? Yeah. I wasn't there just to visit Jewish patients, I became part of the chaplaincy team so that um, I might have to speak to non-Jewish people as well, in fact I did on two or three occasions and uh, I, when I say I enjoyed being a chaplain, yeah. the, the job rather than the patients, but this one particular patient I could tell from the uh, way she spoke that she wasn't born in this country. I said, where are you from? And she said, I'm from wherever it was. I, I survived from whatever camp, I can't remember now. She said, I'm a survivor. I said, I'm also a survivor. She said, how so? So I told her I came in the kinder transport. She said to me, you are not a survivor, you are a refugee. No, you were a survivor. But we're survivor. I survived because I wasn't there for what happened. For sure. Right. I, I liken it, for example, there's a burning building. Uh, people are killed in it. But you are not there because you've gone to the local pub. Right? You survived. You've lost everything, but you have survived. So I, you I, could, survived. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. But that's a debate that goes on and on and on and on. And as far as I'm concerned, kinder transport are survivors. Absolutely. Bernard, you are. Your whole outlook is so.